who have been with us all afternoon and hello to those of you who are joining us for this afternoon's keynote presentation. Just by way of background for our new guests, today concludes day one of the QUB Human Rights Centre Postgraduate Research Symposium on Emerging Issues in Trafficking Research. We've had a very stimulating day of presentations, which I know certainly have given me a tremendous amount of, of food for thought. And I have been just so hugely impressed by the quality of the presentations, the content and the research and the thought that has gone into putting everything together for this afternoon. So well done to everybody. Um, and hopefully that serves as a note of encouragement for anyone who would like to tune in to tomorrow's uh, panel sessions. This afternoon, we are closing off proceedings with a keynote speech, well, two keynote speakers. We have our first speaker, Professor Elspeth Guild from Queen Mary University, London. And Elspeth will then be followed by Professor Sean Mullally from NUI Galway. And Siobhan is also, as I'm sure many of you know, the UN Special Rapporteur on Trafficking in Persons, especially Women and Children. Each of our speakers has 30 minutes each, and that leaves us with an additional 30 minutes for questions and answers. Could I just remind you of a couple of housekeeping rules to ensure that the seminar runs smoothly? Um, could you just remember all to turn off your videos and to mute your microphones? If you do have a question, we uh, have 30 minutes for questions and answers at the end, and I would encourage you to use the chat bar function where you can post your questions. Either post them um, as the moment takes you, as the presentations go along, or if it's something uh, that you want to maybe post at the end, obviously feel free to do that. Uh, but if you could just keep everything muted and turned off and use the chat bar function, that would be much appreciated. Um, so first of all, I'm going to hand over to Professor Elspeth Guild, who will start off our keynote presentations this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you very much, Cheryl, for such a nice introduction. And thank you very much to the organizers for such an interesting uh, afternoon. I very much enjoyed our previous session. I'm going to try and share my uh, screen now. Um, so let's see, I should be successful. Have you got it there now? Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm just trying to, no, I seem to be opening, ah, okay, here we go, here we go, here we go, there we are, okay. I think you can now see my PowerPoint. Yep. Oh, perfect, okay. Um, I was asked to look at emerging issues in human trafficking for this and to try and um, give a bit of some new perspectives on what are the emerging issues. I think that from the two sessions you've had already, it's quite clear that there are some very exciting emerging issues, uh, particularly in the legal domain, particularly in the regional domain, and certainly as many of the, um, the, the presentations focused on implementation of legislation and judicial consideration. I wanted to look at COVID-19. Um, ever since March of this year in Europe, we have been, our media has been very much dominated by COVID-19 much as media in China was dominated by COVID-19 the two months before that, and the rest of the world has followed suit. We are now living in a period where there is much talk about a second wave. We have a continuing number of cases which are arising, and we have, um, let me just see if I can, That was a mistake. Um, uh, and we have an increasing number of issues which are arising in respect of COVID. Let's see if I can just get back. What have I done? I didn't want those notes there. And 
I did want to go to full screen. There, yeah. So the first question is, in respect of COVID-19, are the challenges which are being presided, which are appearing as a result of COVID-19 new or old? And to look at this question, I went first to the international and regional organizations with a European focus. Uh, first of all, looking at the OSCE, what did it have to say about trafficking and COVID-19? And I think one of the most useful statements on COVID-19 and uh, trafficking is that of the OSCE, where it insists that what COVID has done is increase the violence in already existing systems of exploitation. Uh, and that is the profound problem, whether it's a problem in um, the context of um, protection of trafficking victims or in other contexts of exploitation, this is where the problem is. It's the increase in violence. Then it states that the, the next problem is the, um, uh, I'm having some problem with my screen here. Let me try this again. Uh, uh, the, the diversion of state resources. So where victims were able to go and seek state resources to assist them in respect of uh, their exploitation, those resources are now being diverted and uh, there is less access to assistance. The third take home of the OSCE, and this is something that I'm going to come back to a number of times, is the victims. And according to the OSCE, in the OSCE, among the OSCE member states, which include Europe and North America, 94% are victims of sexual exploitation, and that 94% are almost exclusively women and children. The question of sexual exploitation will come back again and again. It is a dominant theme of the whole legal framework of trafficking, the implementation framework of trafficking, the uh, application of trafficking, and where those bodies who seek to assist victims of trafficking look to find people who need their assistance. I then looked at the OSCE and the Office uh, for the um, um, ODIHR and UN Women, and they did a big survey in uh, April, May and June this year and produced a report. And they got responses both from survivors of trafficking and from frontline stakeholders. They covered many, many regions of the world. It's not exclusively a European dominated, though OSCE and ODIHR have a wide reach in uh, the European framework. And from both the survivors and the frontline stakeholders, the frontline stakeholders are those people who are seeking to assist, their job is to assist victims of trafficking. They found the following results. First, that there was more vulnerability. Uh, trafficking victims who were already vulnerable were even more vulnerable. Uh, we'll come to look in a minute at what the reasons for that are, and a tremendous increase in online recruitment. And I'm going to come back to the online recruitment in particular as a legal issue uh, before long. The survey also revealed additional barriers to coordination and cooperation, various different kinds of authorities, law enforcement, etc. All of the efforts to try and coordinate these different state bodies to assist in the um, struggles around uh, protecting victims of trafficking and pursuing the perpetrators uh, have become much more difficult and there's much less, um, uh, much less work is being done. The third take home from the survey was that financial resources have been diverted away from the frontline stakeholders and frontline stakeholders are struggling to reach victims. So they want their resources back and they want to increase their capacity to actually help victims of trafficking. 
And finally, the, um, the final take home was the suspension of state activities. So all kinds of state activities central for victims of trafficking and in the previous uh, session, a number of you were looking at asylum processing, asylum in many countries, asylum uh, applications cease to be processed at all, or only in the most um, uh, extreme uh, um, examples where, where did processing continue. And many other kinds of state activities, such as the identification of victims of trafficking, also ceased. The UN uh, interagency platform, ICAT, which I'm sure that you're all familiar with, <clears throat> sought to identify where the problems that COVID-19 has um, had its biggest impact in respect of victims of trafficking. And the first one that they considered to be central was access to healthcare. Now, of course, that's a problem for everyone in a country which has a which has been hit badly by the pandemic, there has uh, health resources have been diverted to dealing with COVID-19 and access to health care for other purposes has been much limited. There's a crisis in a number of countries in the UK as well in respect to, for instance, cancer care. Secondly, they note travel limitations. The uh, lockdowns, uh, the border closures, etc., have had the consequence of separating families. And by separating families, victims of trafficking are made more vulnerable to their uh, traffickers. We um, uh, have seen a number of examples of that in the discussions today. The third issue is household incomes, loss of jobs. So although the incomes of trafficking victims is a topic which is much disputed. How much income do they get? Do they get any income? According to ICAT, one of the big problems is the activities often in the informal or um, unregulated or even illegal sectors of trafficking victims have fallen off enormously, particularly with measures like lockdown, and that has meant they have not been able to send remittances to their families back home. It's an interesting configuration and one which I think uh, would be most useful to study in some greater depth. Diminished access to services. Yes, I think that all of us are aware of just how diminished access to services are, particularly for uh, victims of trafficking as a result of COVID-19 measures. Lots of government departments were closed. Uh, the um, the on only access was online. There's quite some discussion by ICAT about to what extent trafficking victims do or don't have access to online services and can somehow get access to them. But generally there was it was considered that there was a diminution in access to those services. Again, the diversion of law enforcement priorities, law enforcement uh, particularly uninterested in pursuing what are often very difficult prosecutions at the best of times and in COVID-19 times have fallen to the bottom of the list. Delays in identification, so victims of trafficking aren't getting delayed, aren't getting identified, and so they are not getting the services that they would otherwise be entitled to. Delays in access to justice. Uh, anyone who's working in the justice um, with the with the justice institutions will know that trying to get uh, any access to justice in times of COVID nineteen can be very difficult indeed. And in the UK, barristers have been talking about having Skype emergency judicial review applications uh, where everyone gets robed up on both sides and stare eyeball to eyeball in a whole new permutation of rep representation. And I can notes that because of the closure of borders, the um, lack of transport possibilities, there are delays in returning to the home state where the victim wants to go back home. Where there are um, Areas where there, I think I've lost. Have I lost the the PowerPoint? Um, 
there we go. Uh, in in many countries, the um, well, in fact, in the European Union, uh, um, uh, estimated that 90 per 97 percent of flights in the European Union had ended by the time we got to mid-April. So the chances of getting to your home state, finding a flight, finding a train, being able to get a seat on it, were much diminished. The Council of Europe. Greta has also been very active in identifying the problems which COVID-19 have created or exacerbated in respect of victims of trafficking. The problem of no means of subsistence. So if your trafficking victim has not already been identified and already been provided some access to subsistence, then they're going to be completely destitute. Irregular employment and residence the ways out of irregular employment and residence are through identification and the um, uh, issuing of residence documents to the victims. If that doesn't happen, then they're stuck in irregular employment and irregular present, uh, residence. And of course, there is the increased reliance on the um, trafficker. No access to medical or social protection, we've already discussed that. No documents or resources in order to return, that was also an important issue for ICAT. States of emergency, border closures, quarantine rules, all of which have made it infinitely more difficult for victims of trafficking to access resources. And diversion of state resources, the lack of provision of safe accommodation, healthcare and counselling, and those of you who are in the UK may have followed the judgments in the height of the lockdown period in April and May uh, on judicial reviews of um, particularly asylum seekers, but also applicable to victims of trafficking who were required to stay in accommodation sharing rooms with people who had been identified and diagnosed as having COVID-19. And only the High Court was able to order the Home Office to move these people to other rooms where they would have safer accommodation uh, and they could get access to healthcare without sharing the room with a COVID uh, sufferer. Uh, sorry, I, um, I can't see your slides. You can't see my slides. Okay, hang on a second. Uh, when did you stop being able to see the slides or have you never been able to see them? Um, I think we saw them up to uh, the iCAT slide. Okay, okay. Okay. Can you see them again? Yes. Okay. I'll just I'll just leave it there. For some unknown reason, I seem to have. Um, um, got a sidebar, but hopefully it's not a problem. For UNHCR, the um, the main issues which they raised in respect of COVID are mainly legal and procedural. Safeguarding access to asylum, so can someone actually get across the border, find an official to make an asylum application? Processing, processing of applications, UNHCR has been particularly concerned that uh, state resources in immigration departments have been diverted away from processing asylum applications. Backlogs have been building up, which are going to take years to unpick. Uh, applications and interviews, which ought to have taken place, were not taking place. The argument being it's too dangerous in COVID-19. UNHCR is suggesting that the uh, interviews could take place, of course, online. Arbitrary and discriminatory restrictions on free movement. UNHCR is particularly concerned about that. I think the question of arbitrary and discriminatory extends far beyond trafficking victims and refugees or asylum seekers. It's increasingly a question uh, of constitutional and human rights dimensions. The length of restrictions beyond what is necessary. So if you're saying, well, we need legality, proportionality and necessity, is are these restrictions still necessary and the uh, provision of public health services to marginalized communities oh. okay 
The next thing which is raised in quite a number of the reports by the uh, international organizations is trafficking in the online world. And here there really does seem to be some transformations uh, particularly in respect of the production and consumption of pornography. Who is producing it? Are the traffickers producing it? Who is consuming it? How is it being consumed? And uh, who are the actors in the production of this new pornography? Are they victims of trafficking? The question of trafficking uh, and pornography is a particularly complicated one. I'm going to come back to that. Uh, in my final slide because it raises a whole series of questions about uh, legal regimes. But certainly some of the reports also express concern about trafficking and the provision of online sex services. So whereas face-to-face uh, -face is no longer possible, online has become a, a whole new market for sexual services and traffickers have apparently moved quite rapidly into that role. And finally, we have the problem about what is the role in the context of this online uh, of this online world and this online development of trafficking for borders. If trafficking requires the crossing of a border, which of course it doesn't necessarily in national law, but for the Palermo Protocols that is part of protocol that is part of the definition. And what can be done about national assistance services? If the production and dissemination of um, pornography or online sex services take place in a country where that's legal, but where there are limitations in the country where it is uh, being used, what can national assistance services do? The individual who would be perceived as a victim of trafficking in need of national assistance in the country where the uh, online services are being provided may not be perceived as a victim of trafficking in the country where the services are being offered. The OSC, ODIHR and UN Women uh, survey makes 11 recommendations, mainly strengthening implementation and, uh, and identification. Uh, it wants more attention to national strategies, uh, service provision and capacity building. So they focus very much on institutional issues. ICAT is particularly concerned about healthcare work and remittances again arises and access to justice. And UNHCR is particularly concerned about the rule of law and processing of claims. What happens to people in this process? This is my final slide and I think here I want to reflect a little bit on what the international institutions have been discovering and how they see the development of trafficking into the future as a result of the transformations of COVID-19. Going back to my very first slide, you'll recall I mentioned to you that according to the OSCE, 94% of victims are for sexual exploitation and mainly women and children. So from the perspective of quite a number of the agencies, sexual exploitation and women are the key issues around trafficking. But when mobility stops, where does the exploitation go? So if people can't move, those women and children who make up the vast majority of trafficking victims are no longer moving from one country to another country. They're remaining where they are, but their vulnerabilities perhaps uh, remain the vulnerabilities which caused them to seek to move when it was still possible for them to move. This leads us to the whole question of the online world. We have the question of consumers. Where are the consumers? How are the consumers paying? Online, the uh, question of the complicity of financial institutions and different mechanisms of making payments has been used over and over again in a wide variety of different attempts to control the online world and the um, consumption of goods which may be prohibited in one country but not in another in the online world. And so far, those efforts have been of 
fairly limited success, uh, if I can put it that way. And we have the question of the traffic, the, the people who would have been, those women who would have been or might have been trafficking victims, or maybe they aren't trafficking victims. In Where, what, uh, how do they get their entitlements? How can they prove that they are um, uh, victims and get access to some kind of services and some kind of assistance, particularly if they have not left their own country? Always the problem of the refugee definition. No one is a refugee if they are within the borders of their own country. Then we have the problem of legality in the online world and the national legal orders and the inability to reach agreement on legality in the online world, the grave difficulties that any kind of regulation of the online world has had, bearing in mind the um, perhaps the most successful efforts have been in the Council of Europe in the form of Convention 108 plus, which is gradually becoming an international norm, but completely um, marginalized by the United States of America, which remains much opposed to um, an international order of legality on the online world. And then we come to the final issue about where are the new borders in the online world? Where are the borders of the law in terms of trafficking? Can the Palermo Protocol and for instance, the Council of Europe Convention provide standards which will apply without border crossing, uh, which can be used to identify and assist victims of trafficking without the borders? And to what extent is that going to be dependent on the ways in which we define the legality of provision of pornography online, the provision of uh, sex services online, and what are the rights of workers? And here I think, uh, we may need to move out of the world of thinking about trafficking as such and enter into a dialogue with the International Labour Organization. And I will leave it there. I'm terribly sorry for the technical difficulties, everyone. I shall stop sharing my screen now. Thank you very much, Elspeth. Uh, no problem at all whatsoever in respect to the technical difficulties. Um, we all kind of enter this new random online world. I think I'm learning a 